And, and now we are here tonight, just talking. And, uh, you know, we're coming up to when do we start this? We started this in a year ago, like a year ago, right? Yeah, a year ago. I got it in my Facebook memories. It was like a year ago. Oh, so happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. So it's uh, and this started off with us singing, which is lovely, right? That's right. Yep. So yes. um, tonight, as you know, we were talking about last month, I thought it was really good because we were talking about the importance of communication. And that's really Aisha's wheelhouse. And one of the topics was about talking nicely to ourselves, right? Yeah. And doing that's things right. that are nice for ourselves. So tonight, while um, we're going to be talking about the myths of grief, and you're going, well, what does that have to do with the other? And this is just pointing out that sometimes very well-meaning, well-intentioned people teach us things. And I think you covered this as well, that they teach us things that aren't in our best interest. And That's right. more importantly, they're not true. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yep. So um, when it comes to one of the ones that I posted today is time will heal all wounds. And what's your impression about that one? Well, you know, I think what's really interesting when you said about how these things aren't true and how, um, you know, they, they, they don't help us. It's that they're, they're uh, messaging that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation, right? It's how other people were taught to cope. And that's why they teach us the same thing that, well, this is how I was taught to cope. So you should also try coping the same way. And that's this one about time healing all wounds is definitely, you know, such a big myth because it's, it's, it, it's so passive. It requires no, <clears throat> excuse me, it requires no effort. It's just to kind of sit back and allow this magical healing to just come up and take over. And it doesn't happen that way. And wasn't one of your keys ownership? or that's take right. responsibility. So again, this is the other thing that's really interesting about, um, you know, time heals all wounds. Here's the difference. I mean, in, in my, in my uh, experience anyway, is that you have that first year. So the reality is, and, and I think this is where it, it sort of comes from, or at least this is my guess, is that, you know, after you go through the year of firsts, so your first birthday with them not here, their first birthday with, with them not here. Yeah. You know, this isn't the case of a loss. Even in the case of, you know, a divorce or an estrangement, maybe you're estranged from your family, you can you still remember your siblings' birthdays, whether you like to or not. And I know that it's funny because in my family, they're all like my youngest sister is born on Friday, September 13th. So oh. that's like, you know, a significant date. And yeah. uh, and so the thing is, when you go, you know, um, one of the things that we say in the, at the Grief Recovery Institute is grief is the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. So, and, and, and that's really, I think, the big thing when it comes to an estrangement or something like that is that it may have not been good for either of you but it's still a big change, right? So needless to say, especially with loss, you go through the first year because now we're coming up to the holiday season. I know there's lots of people that love Christmas and they throw, they're throw they throwing up the trees. And, and I think that's fabulous. But Christmas, the holidays are also a really painful time for a lot of people, right? And, and it emphasizes that. So um, one of the reasons why I want to take on the myths of grief is that if you're, if you're feeling sad and you think that somehow there's a time limit on grief, there's not, right? So you do have to take action. And, and what kind of action is that is, is, you know, if you're feeling sad, part of it is just is feel sad, you know, like, I, I love the analogy that they give for, um, you know, one of them is like, okay, well, I just punctured my tire okay, we'll sit here because it will, it will take care of itself. Right. Or say you broke your arm. You wouldn't say, okay, well, let's just wait. The time's going to heal that. It's like, yeah. And then your arm's doing some weird thing. And, you know, I mean, because it can heal, but it's really, it, it's, 
it's not really allowing it to heal in a, in a positive way and in, in a, in an empowering way, right. Where you're actually, uh, like one of the things that I know is that if you have a difficult, a challenging relationship with somebody, sometimes you remember all the pain and unless you actually address the pain, you don't get to those little tender memories of like, Oh, I remember, do you remember when this happened? Because there's so much other stuff that's on top of it. Right. So that's the first myth anyway, that time will heal all wounds. Um, so again, after that first year, anything feels better, right? Um, because, oh my goodness, it's a, it's a funny story to me just in, in the tone of our family, but um, like I was leaving the funeral home uh, after my mother's death and I almost ran over a police officer that was doing a speed trap, but I was so out of it. He was literally standing in front of the car doing this. Terrifying to me, terrifying. But in hindsight, it's a funny story where there's times where we just should lock ourselves, not alone, but keep, keep in a place where you're safe, where you can feel whatever it is that you want to feel, feel whatever it is you need to feel and say whatever it is you need to say in a place of safety. So any, any word, any two cents on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that um, place of safety is something that uh, may not always be easy for people to find. I think that, you know, you when you're, to, you know, what does safety mean for someone? What does it mean to actually have a place of safety? Is it a place where you feel comfortable sharing your feelings? Is it a place where you aren't, aren't going to be judged? Is it a place where um, you ha you're not, you're not bound by time? <clears throat> you can be with someone and they can give you as much time as you need. Like safety means a lot of things, right? And, uh, and sometimes you can get some of those things with some people, but not all of those things with some people. So it's, it's understanding for yourself what is the safest space for you to be in to be able to share those feelings. And sometimes we do have to kind of navigate and find different people to talk about different elements with. Also, sometimes that safety comes with just... Um, it can also come with just allowing ourselves to in, in like creating a safe space for ourselves to explore some of those memories. Like I really, what you were saying earlier really resonated with me about how there's, uh, there's often overlap. You're not just, you never really are just feeling one emotion. You're usually feeling four or five or six different emotions at the same time. And how do you really sort through that? Even when you're talking to someone, Sometimes you also need that safe, reflective space where you can explore it. And alongside the thing about communication with yourself, communication is you also want to be honest. Mm -hmm. So like I said, sometimes you're just thinking about the painful times, but if you allow yourself to open up and to explore it, then usually, you know, it's, it's saying always or never doesn't cover the reality of things, right? The reality of things is gray. It's somewhere in the middle. It's maybe rarely or sometimes or occasionally, but it's, 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 you're very hard pressed to get to always and never. Right. Yes. So, you know, yeah. Creating safety is, has a lot of different elements and it can mean whatever it needs to mean for different people. Exactly. And I think, I think sometimes I know there's a lot of people that uh, like the intimacy of strangers, if that makes sense, yes. but it's yes, easier it for you to talk about <clears throat> darkest emotions with somebody that you know is not in your real life that's right like yeah not in your real everyday world because I mean I think that that's and, and again I think we should do something on friendships or relationships in general to say like you know whether it's being in a you know a, a partnership like I mean a marriage or something like that with somebody and expecting that person to be your everything right? Not everybody's meant to be that. It, we also sometimes, the, the way that we find out that, um, the way that we find out that our friends may not be supporting us in the way that we need is when there is a big emotional loss, right? And they're trying to make us feel better. And by doing that, it's maybe dismissing what it is that you're feeling, right? And, that, and, and so, 
sometimes we get into those conversations and the whole time heals all, heals all wounds. It's like, okay, six months has gone by. They haven't mentioned how they are, but you know, I usually just send like a couple little notes sometimes if I, if I know them well enough and I've had a conversation with them that just says, uh, you know, I hope you're well, feel whatever you need to feel whenever you need to feel it. And that's what I send It's just a reminder. And if you need somewhere to do that, you know where I am. So it's like, it's a reminder that, that, um, you know, even in our partnerships, they'd be, they may be dealing with, the same kind of uh, emotional turmoil about it. So it's too painful to, and how many times have mothers out there said, well, I can't cry. I can't show, I have to be strong for my kids. And there we go, perpetuating the myths, right? So. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what it is. It is, these are myths. These are things that we've, this is lore that we've uh, grown up thinking is the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And it's really now about, understanding that we co-create our reality, we co-create what's true for us, and that we have absolute, uh, absolutely the right and the, the capacity to be able to make our own choices and to create the reality that we want for ourselves. And that means giving ourselves the healing space, giving us the priority and, you know, taking care of ourselves. Now, having said that, you know, there's also, uh, there's also cultural and familial, you know, infrastructure that's in place that makes it hard. Uh, I would say, you know, um, cis women in general, uh, women of color in particular, you know, there is an there is an ingrained idea that we don't that we need to put everybody else first, that we put ourselves last, that we, you know don't put the oxygen mask on ourselves. We put it on all the people that we care about before we do that. We put it on ourselves. And that has always been something to our detriment. That's definitely kind of an, an old school, a very patriarchal, a very kind of um, societal uh, more that, you know, needs to be dismantled now because we, we can't take care of other people if we're not taking care of ourselves. And that's a, that's a perfect segue um into like I, I, i'm going to combine these two myths and that is don't show any emotion right grieve on your own you know like uh you know i was told that growing up when it just had to any time i was crying it's like oh i'll give you something to cry about and you know these days even at this age that was common unfortunately that there would be mm -hmm. some sort of physical reaction to that but the thing is, it doesn't take away from the fact that you still swallowed those feelings somewhere. And then the other one is that you have to be strong for others slash take care of others. And those are two sides of the same coin and both of them to our detriment. Cause as you said, um, you know, the whole putting on your mask first, but it's also more importantly, um, you know, there's some cases, a lot of times mothers, it's, it's, they think that their children don't know what's going on. And meanwhile, if we talk about ourselves as children, we knew what was going on. We may have, may have had to have different language to use it, but there's definitely, uh, you know, if we're all taking care of everybody else, then who's taking care of us, right? More importantly, none of us are really taking care of anybody because we're just making sure that everybody's fine. I'm fine. We're fine. You know, the Academy Award winning, everything's fabulous. And, and that's why it's really, I mean, this is how it goes with life, right? Is that we have this, you know, grief is cumulative and it's never positive. It's never positive. And that's why, I mean, a lot of times, let's face it, midlife crises, we see what's going on right now with COVID that people are getting stressed out about things because you would have had all the rest of that grief that's somewhere else. And now you've had this huge change. Again, going back to that meeting, the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or, or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Well, nobody knows still, like people are trying to get back to work. We still don't know what that's gonna look like. There's so many people that have made the choice to say enough for this. I'm moving to, I'm gonna live in a van somewhere and you know they're going off the grid. So, but at least like, I think the one thing is, is that over this last time, 
people, many people have taken the opportunity to say, well, what is it I really feel? And that's today. But the challenge with, you know, not showing our emotions, that was one that was taught in our family. We were, you know, very stoic, you know, the British, uh, the British stiff upper lip stuff. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, and as an intuitive, I can remember, especially in death, that I would see around me, I could feel what people were feeling. So that was also hard because I knew that people weren't fine, but I also, it's not like you can, I was like 10, you know, I can't push an adult to, to really tell me what you're feeling. So yeah. those two were another two very powerful, disempowering beliefs that we have. What do you think, Aisha? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, you have to do it by yourself. You can't show your emotions. You can't, uh, you have to take care of other people. I mean, those are all, you know, these absolutely follows through with that whole theme of putting yourself last and not allowing yourself to take care of things. And I think also, you know, when you don't show your emotions, you also don't know your emotions, mm. you know, and what a big thing to really be able to connect with what's happening inside and really dig down and see, well, you know, most of the time, you know, um, I'll speak about my experience that I, I had going through this process with you is that oh, the overarching theme in some of the, the grief situations was anger. And I didn't realize what else was, was underneath that until we really dug into it, you know, and there was, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of uh, grief. There was a lot of grief there around loss, around um, not enoughness, around um, about th about loss, like about not having access to people or to feelings or to situations. And, you know, and for me, uh, coming from trauma, I have a lot of gaps in my in my memories. So there's a lot of grief also around that of not being able to ground myself in what happened in the past for me. You know, I have little bits and pieces of my memory that I can go back to and 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 then there's a lot that's missing. So not just the not just the bad, but a lot of the good is missing, right? So being able to access that to make yourself feel whole and complete so that you actually have access to those feelings. Like it is a process to to be able to to do that for yourself and to give yourself that time and space and that safety, which thank you so much. You are that safe space for me and you are for so many other people and anyone who's lucky enough to have you as a grief recovery specialist, mm. you know, creating that safety gives me the chance to actually go back and see if there's anything else I can, I can connect to. And I did connect to things that I thought were lost to me. And that was invaluable, absolutely hundred percent invaluable mm. because we live this narrative that we have for ourselves, which is it's X, Y, Z. And then when you start doing a process like this and you go, oh my God, it's not just X, Y, Z, it's, you know, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And then, you, then you're filling in some more blanks. You're, you're creating a richness and a tapestry there where before it was just threadbare. Exactly. And that's, oh my God, again, the perfect words. You always have the perfect words because the, the other part is if we, if we cannot feel the lows, we cannot experience the highs, right? Exactly. And yeah. so, um, again, I saw, <clears throat> you know, a, a good friend uh, posted something the other day about, you know, if you're just feeling sad, well, if you have that state of melancholy, if you have like, and when I say melancholy, there's a difference between depression and a depressing time, right? Depression is a long-term chemical imbalance, like, there's differences. Whereas if you're just feeling like, Hey, I don't really want to get out and do what I normally like. Um, you know, those are signs of grief, but because we, we medicalize a lot of things and here, well, let's throw, Oh, I'm breaking out crying every, like, I can tell you because of the processing I was doing around my mother, my mother, like November 13th was, was her date. And I can tell you that it stirred up a lot of stuff. And so this time was really weepy. So like the whole week before was just, I like to call it rocking and rolling, but I find that, you know, cause grief is, it shows that you love something enough to miss it. 
right? But more importantly with this, I was able to get into parts of our relationship that I never would have gotten into in a therapeutic or in any other kind of manner, because this is a method. It's like, it's, it's a structure, right? So, but it's also having those, those myths and, and knowing them, does it, it changes your mind. Like it changes the way, because then all of a sudden you do something and it's like, oh, is that really, is that really what I think? Is that really what's going on? And so that's something that's really important to keep in mind, right? Is that, is that, um, it's, it, it, it is wonderful. This is not a bash for therapy. This is not because everything helps us take a, take a step forward. But again, the whole fact that a lot of what is really grief, and I loved that you brought up, uh, you know, the loss of innocence, the loss of safety, the loss of safety is huge. And I think that, um, there's a lot of people where it's like, oh, well, that's just what it was like back in the day. And it's like, or it's culture where we don't talk about the pink elephant that's standing in the corner of every single family gathering we have. And with that kind of stuff, we don't allow ourselves because then even though it's not being told to you to go grieve on your own, you're not supported in your, in any of your emotional expressions. So Right. And then you throw it that if there is something that you're, you know, like the passing of somebody that matters, a grandparent, which is usually the first situation, you, you can't express. You already know that your feelings are not welcome here. And now it's even more, well, we've got to take care of, make sure everybody else is okay. So it's okay that I watch Aunt Sally cry, but I'm not allowed to cry. Right. So, and that can be really detrimental. I think it, it can also, I absolutely 100% agree with you. And I think that it can also be very intimidating because when we don't have the opportunity, like you were saying earlier about the highs and the lows, when we don't have the chance in any kind of safe setting and on a regular basis to explore what the highs and the lows are, then it makes us fearful to explore them. Because then you feel like, I don't know if I can handle this and I don't even want to try Ooh. because I can't handle these big emotions that are going to come. And when you're in a, when you are in a safe space, when you're, you're, for example, when you are uh, following the method and you're exploring that stuff, then it, um, it, it normalizes feeling those things. It normalizes the experience of being very sad or grieving or being happy or feeling comforted. Like all of that stuff becomes normalized because all of a sudden you are actually connecting with you're connecting your feelings with the memories that you have, right? They're not compartmentalized. They're not divided so that you can't put them together. Then you actually start making those connections. And that's what brings you that wholeness and allows you to start experiencing your feelings in a different way. And then as you go forward, then you appropriately apply grief, joy, fear, you know, because now you're understanding yourself more you're actually able to experience it in a way that's not shaming for yourself and that that's whole for you, that you're actually doing it in a way that's whole and healing for yourself. And, and I mean, you brought up the, the point that a lot of what you felt was anger and that's scary sometimes. Cause that's a, oh, very, yeah. Uh, you know, so, um, and, and I think though, I mean, I don't, for, for me, when doing these processes, it's usually a sadness, which is normally underlying anger, but I would say to you, like, so by dealing with the anger, do you find it easier now to deal with that kind of expressive behavior? Like, so, so in other words, um, going through it and allowing yourself to be angry at this now, whenever I come across something else and it normally would have made me worse, it, like respond worse that now you find that it's easier to just go, okay, there's something there and, and not dismiss that anger. Is that something that you found? I think so. I also feel like the anger is much less than it was because in, in shutting it down and denying it, then it, it, it comes up again and again, and it's very, and it's very overwhelming. But once you open that door and you allow yourself to feel, then, then you're not, then you recognize that this is a feeling that I feel that I am going to feel and that it's going to pass. And then when it passes, 
you allow all the other stuff to, to start coming up as well. Well, it isn't just anger, it's grief, it's sadness, it's fear, it's loss, it's, um, it's disappointment, it's discouragement, it's feeling stuck, it's all of these things that I had just put that kind of blanket statement that it's anger. And then all these other things come up. And now I also recognize anger and I can, I can validate myself for being angry and say, you know, it's okay for me to feel angry about this because this is not a nice thing that happened. Right. And then I can go, okay, I feel angry, but I also feel all these other things as well. And then that helps to, 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 to deal with anger in a way that is resonant and that's healing rather than for it to be overwhelming and for it to dictate the way that I feel or the way that I interact with things, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, this is, again, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm just checking. Yeah. Cause we're already at half an hour and we've only got through three of them. Um, but again, this is why I love this just talking. Right. And, and the thing that's also interesting is the fact that a lot of this is also about your critical communication, right? And being able to communicate. Yeah. There is a certain level, level of honesty, but I think the interesting part is the context, right? Is, is that, um, first of all, when we know how to feel those different emotions, when we know what they feel, um, when, they, when, when you know what they feel like, they're easier, you know, one of your thing is the pause, right? I love the pause that you were introducing when you were doing like in, in last month's sessions. And the great thing about this is that now it's like, okay, I'm angry. I'm not ready to deal with this because I'm not really sure where this is coming from and I want to explore it, right? So you can add your effective communication of like, okay, you know what? I'm going to get back to you. I'm going to get back to you. I don't want to talk about that. Or this isn't something I'm, I'm prepared to address at this time. And I think that it's, and again, once we give ourselves permission to like be nice and kind to each other and being kind, it doesn't mean that you're not going to go through hiccups and that you're not going to go through things that, that are, that challenge us, but it, it means that we, we need to be consistent in what is our intention is our intention to connect with each other or is our intention to be right. And this is where, um, you know, that old saying ignorance is bliss it's seldom bliss. I mean, the good thing is you don't know how messed up, you don't know what you don't know, but when it comes to especially something as huge as grief, because it can be hidden in a whole bunch of other things, right? We can be a survivor of something for our whole life. And it's been like, we've spent more time, you know, as a survivor than we did as a person doing that. And then what does a survivor mean? You know? So um, and I know we're, we're already into half an hour with this. So um, there's three other myths that we commonly talk about with a grief recovery method, but um, maybe I'll post those through the week and uh, we'll just wrap this up. I love this conversation though. And I love the way that it dovetails, everything dovetails into each other, right? So well, why, don't we, why don't we just split this up? Why don't we do the other three next week? We're going to do the other three next week. That's what I love about just talking because it's not scripted. It's just, it's a conversation and I, I do appreciate it. And it's, and it's, it's also great. You know, I'm one of these born salespeople that once I've been through something and I think it's fabulous, I think everybody should do it, but this is turning out that, that it's, it's having that same effect on other people too, that it is something that's a worthwhile process. And it is a tool. It's tools in your kit that allow, that allow you to be more present when you're communicating with anybody. But first of all, and most of all, with yourself. So the three that we covered tonight are um, time heals all wounds. The second one is grieve alone. And the third one is be strong, take care of others. So any final comments, Aisha? Um, no, I think that's great. I think we've covered a lot and I'd love to hear what people have to say about these three different um, myths and the other ones that we're going to cover next week, because surely people out there have also experienced grief and dealing with grief in different ways. And I think what I was going to say, uh, just to close was that, um, you know, uh, the, the thing about grief and, and how we're told to deal with grief in society is something that you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with us like when we're getting this help when we're getting this support to do go through grieving it's not because there's some kind of shortcoming in us it's because we were never taught 
and our parents were never taught and their parents were never taught. So this is just an, a shortcoming that is across the board for people that they didn't get <clears throat> this kind of um, education or this kind of support to be able to understand how to grieve properly. So there's no shame in asking for help. It's actually something that is ultimately very, very healing. And like you said, you're, you're a salesperson for it because it did wonders for you. I, I am now a supporter of it because it's done wonders for me as well. So definitely this is a method that is powerful and healing and transformative for sure. That's awesome. Thank you, Aisha. I love this book. I know, I know, I love you too. But and so, yeah, so leave in the comments or send us questions if you have anything. So that's the first three. I'll post that in the in the group. And again, join us next week where we'll take on the, the next three myths of, uh, of grieving, of, you know, some of the things that we're taught about, uh, about grief that are probably harming us. And again, if you have any questions in general, if you're interested about learning more about the grief recovery method, please get in touch with me. And, um, you know, it's also, I know this is totally off topic, but both Aisha and myself, you know, we do tarot. If you're looking for a fun thing to do with your families, something that can be done online, we can do little tarot parties for you. So um, that's also something too. So just because okay. it's just, she got me these new cards and they're so beautiful and I love them. But anyways, we'll see you on Tarot Tuesday. I'm sorry, I get all excited. So much love, my darling. Love it. And love we you. shall love see you, you guys you. all next week. Next week. Take care and have a fabulous week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye.